so quiet. Oh, hello, how are we all? Good, cool. So uh, we're going to talk, not just Angular 2, because I still love Angular 1. So um, we're going to kind of talk about components and the, the types of components and where we kind of came from, all the way back to directives. So um, there will come a, a bit in a couple of slides time where I would like some people to shout out some answers to me. Um, if you don't, I will fail my demo. So this talks from component to component. Has anyone not used, uh, who's using Angular 1 still? Awesome, who's using Angular 2? Who's crazy enough? <laughs> and who's, who's using the dot component method in Angular 1? A few people, okay. Who would like to learn about the component method in Angular 1? Awesome. So uh, this is pretty new, uh, the dot component method, and then we'll kind of walk through what it is and uh, why and how you should use it. So uh, that's my name, Todd Motto. If you want to send me some tweets later or if you've got any questions afterwards or if you want to see the slides, uh, send me a tweet. So this is basically my talk, four bullet points. It's the story of Angular, kind of go back a few years, and then we'll think about from directives, where we came from, to dot component, and then how we can go from dot component to at component, which is the Angular 2 syntax. Uh, and then we'll kind of fill in some information about the types of components, because anyone can create a component, but what does it do? So I want to kind of help everyone understand the types of components that they're creating. So the story, the fun parts. Learning Angular JS, if you would go. Oh, ah, there we go. This, this was my thoughts. Uh, I don't usually use animated GIFs or anything, but I thought it's, as it's kind of a story, we could use some strange images. So uh, at the beginning, I, I felt like this. I was sort of floating around, um, feeling like, what the hell is this Angular thing? Like, how do I use it? Um, and the second stage, after you've kind of worked out how to sort of hello world Angular, is the directives, and then the directives, directives, directives. So, uh, bear with me. There we go. <laughs> Who's felt like this with directives? Everyone. I don't believe you. <laughs> so, uh, this is this is how we we felt with directives. Uh, and then it kind of we we kept going, and then services came along. HTTP resource and filters and routing, template directives and then DOM directives. So we kind of, we learned the basics of Angular, we thought about the directives and then we kind of filled in the gaps. We learned services, filters, uh, and ended up with an application. So what made it so difficult? So if anyone's used like Knockout or Backbone or some of the older, we call them older, um, application frameworks is that their Angular 1 was very unique and it was it's so big because it, it kind of changed the way that we think and build on the web. So it was a new way to build web apps and the Google team kind of came in and said, yeah, here's Angular and you, everyone's like, okay, I can, I can get it working, but there's so many ways that we can build Angular apps. Uh, and that kind of added to some of the confusion that um, kind of led with it. So one of the main things I think is tough for people to learn Angular is the, the, the flexibility of directives in Angular 1. We could do absolutely anything uh, with a directive. You could build one directive for your entire app if you wanted to, or you could break it down, or you could do much more better structure. And we also had two-way data flow, um, also two-way data binding. So if you update an input, you can update some text elsewhere. If you update the text, it updates the input. Uh, which was okay, and now we kind of moved on. And I've put the docs. That's that's what also made it a little bit more difficult to uh, to learn. So, dot directive. This is where I uh, I need you guys. So, it's not too ta tasking right now, but can I can somebody name a property that goes on a directive? Link. link. Okay. So we have link function. What else? Scope, yeah. Restrict. 
left. Yeah. Transclude. Replace. Require. Require. <laughs> Template. Yeah. Say again. Controller. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, we got compile, which then can return a link function or a pre-link or a post-link, so that's even more confusing. Um, there's also controller as. Um, bind to controller. True, or you can use the object form. <coughs> uh, there's also some of the other ones, like terminal true, priority. So, so you end up with this huge list of things, and you, at the end, you kind of think, what have we done? So uh, the good news is, is that we have this new component method in Angular, which makes the design of our apps a lot better. So let me flick back. This is kind of, if anyone follows me on Twitter, you might have seen uh, this next slide. But this is how I summed up the dot directive. So the idea here is that it works, but it's probably not that good. Uh, it can be improved. So it works, but could be better. I'm ahead of myself. So uh, this is when emojis were supported in tweets, uh, slides. So we then have this dot component that, that comes in and saves the day. We don't end up with this kind of mess. Uh, and we'll kind of look at, if you're still using Angular 1, I mean, look, that's great. Um, but there's, there's a bunch of these that we can just kill off because component is a completely new design pattern that we can actually use. So component is like the new template directive. So we, we, we split it immediately. It has these lifecycle hooks. It's an isolate scope by default. Uh, it's one-way data flow. We've got one-way data flow now in directive, uh, dot .component. And we can do the property and event binding. So all of these things are in Angular 2. So if you're, if you're using Angular 1.5 now, you can start using component in a year, a month, however long it takes you to want to go to Angular 2. You've got the design patterns, the understanding, and you can just migrate there uh, much more easily. Uh, so what I'm going to actually show you first is uh, basically two types of components, which we've got marvelously named component one and component two. So component two is just a child component of component one. It sits in the same template. So what we actually want to do is I, I put a dollar control dot user here. So if you've, if you've used the controller as syntax, uh, that's basically, if I can spell it right. So we used to do things like VM. Uh, in dot component, dollar control is the default. So it kind of, we don't need controller as anymore. We can just get rid of it. Uh, every component's isolate scope, so you don't have to worry about dollar control, like namespacing uh, collisions or anything like that. So. What we're going to do real quick is basically create some data in the new component method and then basically pass it down to the child component and then integrate some of the lifecycle hooks and just I'll try and do it as quickly as possible. So uh, has anyone heard of this on init? One, two, three. As soon as one hand goes up, everyone's goes up. So on init. Now, I actually spoke to Pete uh, Bacon Darwin, who's the lead Angular 1 developer. Um, and I'm pretty sure um, when we do stuff like this and then initialize content inside a controller for a particular component, this now kind of lives in here. So any initialization logic goes in this, inside the, this dot on init. So what we can do here, this is just a simple example that we'll build just to sh demonstrate the types of components that we can create and the lifecycle hooks. So uh, we can create this.user. I'll put my name in, and then we'll do location, England, UK. Uh, if, you, if it's like data purposes, they sit nicely inside on init. Uh, that gets called when the, the component's basically ready. So what else we can do? Um, 
we'll set up a function. So this basically kills off two-way data binding. So if you're using two-way data binding, everyone's like, what? Equals sign for the win. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna show you that you don't need two-way data binding, because previously, if, if we passed some data from here down into this component, and then this component manipulated the data, it would just constantly re rebind itself. So let's do, uh, let's create a function called update user. This can live outside of the on init because it's not really an initialization thing. Uh, and then we basically, I'll leave that for now actually, we'll fill it in a bit. Puss the event. So in Angular 2, uh, we obviously do the square braces and these ones, but in Angular 1, we just simply do, uh, we create uh, a property called user, and we can pass in $control.user. That's pretty simple. So I'll show you all this, and then we'll kind of learn about the design pattern behind these. So this is kind of an input, so we pass data into a component. And then what we basically want to do is manipulate that data inside the component, and when it's ready to send back to the parent, we can then press a button and bang, it's done. So we'll create a function, well, a property called onUpdate, where we can pass the update user function into. So we can do dollar control, update user, we can call the function. Um, if you've used Angular 2, we basically pass uh, data down and fire events back up. So we're, we can use the same pattern now in Angular 1. So I use this dollar event thing because you can call it whatever you want, but if you use an event object, then it's consistent. <coughs> so, uh, then essentially we've got two bindings, uh, user and then on update. Uh, we pass that one in here, that passes that object in, and I think, I oh know I need to bindings it before we can display things. So we have this bindings thing. If you've never heard of bindings, it's essentially scope, or where you do sort of foo and then equals or something like that. So this bindings object is the new scope slash bind to controller all in one. So we've got a property called user. So we just do this. And instead of doing the equals, we use the left arrow, which indicates one way data flow. It could have gone the other way, it would have made more sense. But that's pretty much it. And then we have this, this attribute here on update. So we can do on update. And this is cool because I never really used to use the ampersand, but it allows you to pass a function down into a component. So let's have a look in the browser. Yeah, it works. Cool. So this, I'll blow it up a bit. There we go. Marvelous. So that object at the top is from the parent component. So it's actually up here and then we're passing the data into another component and then displaying it. So you've got the parent, parent data, child component that renders it. And you'll see now that if I start to change things, it just updates the parent object, which is two-way data binding. It's not really that great. Um, so it's not technically two-way data binding because we're using this one-way data flow, but because it's an object in JavaScript, Angular doesn't actually break the reference to the object, so we have to do that ourselves. So this is uh, quite easy to do. We use this function called onChanges. So I actually managed to write a polyfill for the dot component method that goes back and works in Angular 1.3. So this works in like 1.5.5. So I kind of understand how this is weird. So this is the, the kind of strange bit. So if you imagine we've got this piece of data that comes down in one-way data flow, and we basically want to clone it and then reassign it to the child component so it just complete, completely breaks that isolation of the, the reference. So in this case, um, we basically have this.user available in the controller. So we get this changes object. I'll explain when this actually gets called. Uh, actually, we probably want to do if changes.user, then we want to actually assign something like this. So we can then do Angular, dot copy, um, and then we want to copy, actually I'm just gonna use, oh yeah, I've forgotten the syntax to that. <laughs> we use object assign. So, 
object assign basically merges the two objects. Um, so let me show you this changes object first. Um, let's comment that out so it doesn't break. Boom. So there we go. So we get this changes object that gets run basically at runtime. And it's, you get a, 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 it's a prototype function you can call is first change because this, you see that nothing's changed but the function's already been run. So this actually runs at runtime. So if you want to do any initialization logic and cloning data, this is the place to do it. Then we have this current value and previous value, which there is no previous value because it's uninitialized value, which is just an undefined instance uh, in the actual code itself. So what we can do is use uh, changes.user and then this dot current value. So changes.user.current value. And what we can basically, I'll, I'll log it out just so you can see it. So that gives us the whole object. So that's the object from the parent. We basically want to take that and assign it here. So object assign will basically make a copy and merge the object. So when we start typing, you see nothing is updating the parent. So this is much better in terms of predictability of your code. And yes, this, this piece is Angular 1, but the exact same concept applies in Angular 2. So when we hit this change details button, we then want to send the data back up. So let's quickly implement that. Uh, so if we do a console log, we should have this dot update user as a function, I uh, know, oh on update. So update user is being passed from the parent into the child under an alias called on update. So if we console log this, we should have a function. Yeah, so we got just a function there. Uh, and then what we can basically do we want to call this function when something changes. So if we clone the data, manipulate it, and then send it back. So it's, it's this predictable flow of data rather than everything just updates everything. So you tell it when to update. Uh, so I'm going to create a function called onSubmit. Inside here, we're going to call the onUpdate function. And then we're basically going to pass the manipulated data back up. Uh, pass an object in, and here I'm creating a property called dollar $event. So this kind of this is to mirror the Angular sort of syntax. Uh, la, 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 uh, user, there we go, and then this dot user. I'll explain this in a second. Ng submit, and then we want to call dollar control on submit. Don't need to pass anything in because everything's just available in the controller. So the flow of that is we get the piece of data, pass it into a property, manipulate it, send it back uh, via an event. It's like a fake event. Uh, hopefully this should work. Yay, it works so well. Uh, this the on submit. Say that again, sorry. Ah. Oh. Yeah, I knew that. I was just testing you. There we go. Let's try it. There we go. So, thank you. <laughs> uh, so we basically pass a function down here, and we specify that the argument is going to be dollar $event. You could call it user if you wanted to, but it just keeps things consistent, just having event everywhere. Same with dollar $control. If dollar $control is everywhere, things look consistent. So we can log out the event, but what we want to do when the event actually gets fired is basically reassign this.user. So we can just do event.user, and that's it. I'll leave that there just so you can. So this.updateUser gets passed in. We manipulate things, press the button. It then The child component then calls the function from the parent, which then basically just passes the data back up. It's, it looks more complicated than it is. So, get rid of that. There we go. Uh, so, we'll put Tom DeLong, California, and then there you go. So, that's probably a lot more optimized 
than two-way data binding that updates every single keystroke, every single digest cycle. So <clears throat> this kind of demonstrates some of the lifecycle hooks in dot component. That's probably the biggest one uh, if you use an Angular 1.5, but the same pattern applies to Angular 2 as well. Uh, has anyone got a question for on that, any of that? Just why not? No? Someone was waving at the back. Cool. So back to our list of horrible directiveness at the beginning. So this was quite a lot. Uh, the doc component actually supports um, stuff like transclude, so that's that's nice and easy, um, which means we can we can basically get rid of scope. We can you can keep restrict, but use it just for attributes only. We don't need uh, transclude. You can use that if you want. We don't need require anymore. Don't need a template. Don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. So really, you're left with a much cleaner directive definition because you're using a component. So the actual um, design between the two is a component, you would basically create some kind of template like we just have, has some data in it, and then it passes it down into another uh, component. So this is my short list of what not to use on a directive now, dot directive. So if you've got scope, that can just be moved over to a component, bind to controller, don't need it anymore, it's bindings. Uh, controller, controller as, require, template, template URL. So most of that stuff we shouldn't really use because it's data sort of driven. Um, and it's, think about the templates. So if you want to use a directive, you can then, like if you want to listen to a keyboard event, for example, one of our inputs, that would be a good, good place for a directive that we can bind it to the input, listen for the event, and then just use the link function, something like that. Otherwise, what we used to do is probably merge all the two, and you end up with a link function that's 1,000 lines long, controller that's 1,000 lines long, and things are a bit messy. Uh, so this leads on to the types of components. It's a less component. So that actually does say stateless component. So <laughs> stateless component, stateful component, and then rooted comp. So we've got three different types of components. I think I can change the resolution, but we won't for now. The main word's in the middle of the screen. Uh, so does anyone not know what a stateless component is, or stateful components? Everyone knows a stateful. I could skip this bit. So uh, stateless component basically is what we kind of just created. So it has a defined input and a defined output. Data enters via property binding. That's what we use in Angular 2. We just use an attribute in, in Angular 1. Uh, and then data leaves via an event. So we've just created an event, and it passes the data back up. Uh, these are also known as stateless, dumb, presentational components. Uh, la -la. Then we have the stateful components. So these are pretty similar, but with a twist. And the, the key is to understanding the design pattern of the component, whether it's dot component or at component in Angular 2, um, because we all can create different components, but they have roles now, and these are the, the kind of three roles. So the first one's stateless, and then we've got stateful. So the stateful component is, is in charge of going and fetching data. So you see in our, in our example here, this component is not in charge of fetching data. Like it, it's just past data. And it has a defined input called user, and it has an output called on update. So we pass data in, manipulate it, and send it back. Whereas this could be a stateful component. So we actually have some data in here, which that could, that could come from my service dot get, something like that. So it's a stateful, it manages state. Uh, da, da, da. And then it basically renders the child components. So we could have uh, like a root component that has multiple child components, and it basically renders them out like this one. So we could have, we could have a few of these, could be loads of different components. But the stateless basically takes the data, passes it into state, no, stateful to stateless. So these, these, these are all stateless. And that being stateless allows them to be reusable. Like if you think about Google Mail with each individual item 
in your inbox is not going to be stateful. It's not going to be in charge of its own data. Like there's going to be one request, maybe, that basically takes that and then renders all of them, binds the click events, et cetera, et cetera, populates um, all the, the HTML. That says rooted component. So a rooted component is basically a stateful component, but with a root definition. So instead of what we used to do, where we just had like app.js, then a monstrous folder of files, and then router.js with like all of state provider, dot state, dot state, dot state, dot state, and so on, we actually move all of those definitions to the components themselves. So if we wanted our component here, to be a rooted component, we could simply create like a, a dot config on here. We can pass in UI router, we can or ng root, not the new component router, um, and basically set up the routing configuration for the particular component rather than just assuming some application-wide um, like configuration. So we got two love hearts for this one. The font's a bit weird, but you can see it says at component. So this is basically, there's a lot to type in here. Uh, how long we got? 10 minutes. Let's do it. So uh, actually, I don't have a button on that. So uh, this is how we basically apply those concepts to Angular 2 as well. It's unfortunately not as easy to run as Angular 1 in the browser so we won't live demo it. So uh, we import the component from Angular Core. We create some kind of component definition. Now, if you think about the dot component, this is exactly the same stuff. So if you imagine at component doesn't exist and you kind of merge this, this ES6 class with the at component, you end up with Angular 1.5's dot component, where you have a controller, a template, uh, and any logic, that kind of thing. So these basically decorate the ES6 class. They kind of merge the two and tell it what to do. So that's not a lot different from what we just saw in Angular 1. Uh, then we can use some uh, constructor, this dot message, hello world, and then this basically, excuse me, uh, we can just print that out as message. And the only change here is that if you took our component here, and refactored this to at component, it would probably take about two minutes. So we can drop the dollar control, which goes here. We can use at component instead, convert things to ES6. And if you're using ES6 with Angular 1, it will take you one minute, not two. So we can, we basically got a couple of types of components here. So these are just going to be fake chat components. So if you've got like a high level chat, like a module or something like that, Google chat, Hangouts, um, it will basically, we're, we're going to walk through how to create like a stateless component, a stateful component, which then renders out child components uh, in Angular 2. So let's assume we have this chat component defined somewhere else. We'll look at it next. We import it from chat.component. And then, uh, this is a bit annoying, but we have to do it. Uh, we specify directives inside an array, and we basically just pass the reference to that component into um, the directives. That then allows us to use the custom element called chat. So in Angular 1, we could just register a directive and just start using it. Whereas if you want to use it in Angular 2, in a specific template, you have to use this directives array. So stateless and stateful components uh, in Angular 2. So if you imagine we've got this chat.component with that custom element, we basically, what we want to do, uh, we can import the usual stuff. We've got the selector called chat. And then we're going to have three different types of components. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter that we can't see what these components are. It's the theory behind them. So if you've got like a chat module, you're going to want like a chat profile. So whether you're your face, your picture, your name, whether you're online, offline, uh, then you might want a list of friends uh, where you can click on somebody and chat to them. And then you might want to search for a friend if you've got more than me. 
Um, then you can type someone's name in, it brings up their search result. So they're gonna be our three child components, which we can make completely stateless. So we can inject them as usual, check profile, blah, blah, blah. We can register them in the directive. And then just like this in Angular 1, where we're rendering a child component, we basically pass the stuff in here, we're rendering these child components here as well. So it's the exact same concepts. Uh, we've got this, I, was, I spoke to Pete at Angular 1, I was like, can we get styles or something in Angular 1 just to make it cooler? Um, has anyone heard of this? A few people? Cool. So if you've sort of followed web components and stuff like that, um, there's something called Shadow DOM, which is like DOM within DOM. Um, so it, it allows you to like, it's kind of like an isolate scope directive, but native in the web browser. So you can completely cut off styles, JavaScript, HTML, and you can make these reusable components. So if you actually set the encapsulation uh, to native, so we use this view encapsulation.native, you can see on line four right at the top that we just import that from Angular Core. So we just basically tell it to use .native. Um, that will basically turn it into a proper web component when it's, when it's rendered. This, uh, we won't whiz through that today, but it has a, an in interesting impact on um, how all the styles are basically rendered. So you can, you can leave them globally exposed or you can make them web components. We can actually use an emulated version where Angular will actually rewrite your styles for you with a unique key to pretend that they're web components. Uh, One-way data flow in Angular 2. So just like before, we had like an object. We got chat user, chat term, chat friends. These are just three properties. Uh, let's look at chat user. So exactly the same as Angular 1, we have this user here. We just pass the, pass the information in. Uh, we use the square brackets here, and then we just reference chat user. So that is exactly the same as, as the component in Angular 1. There's not a huge difference apart from we've now got a square bracket. Uh, chat term, we can then pass in as well, and then chat friends, which is just an array. You can imagine that these come from a back-end response. Obviously, I can't fake a back-end response. I want to show you what it would probably look like. Uh, and then we can basically just pass everything in to each component. So where we basically injected the update user function down here and, and the expected dollar event back, we created this property called onUpdate. It's a pretty good idea to use on because it's like on click, on submit. It kind of indicates that an event's happening. So in Angular 2, we use event binding. So we got three functions. In the Angular 1 demo, we had just one function, but that's, that's fine. So here we got three. And you can see we got event, event, event. Um, and as you probably expect, we just pass the function in. We expect this dollar event object back. And instead of square brackets, we're using these rounded ones, status change. So we're passing in some information. Uh, we, can, we don't need to clone it uh, in Angular 2, it's fine. Um, you'd probably be better abstracting the data to some model store Redux style. Um, then, so here's just an example, like if, if I have my search component and I start typing for somebody's name, I can then listen to those characters. Then I could maybe pass that back up to the parent. And then I can say, okay, so this dot friends, which, oh, that should be chat friends, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, so we can basically like do a filter or something on the array that allows us to manipulate or go and make a search for the particular friend if they're not in that initial collection of lists. So all the work happens in this base sort of stateful component. So we take the data, delegate it down, all the little components do their work and then pass things back up. So it makes it, makes it a lot more predictable and manageable. Uh, quick note on template and syntaxes. I'm trying to whiz through this. Um, so if in JavaScript you've got like an object, you can, you can dynamically look it up via square brackets and then you could use like a, key, uh, a variable called key, but you, you can also do my object dot property or dot foo, but you can also look it up as a string uh, if it's got a weird character in that you need to. So for the square brackets where we pass data in, think about an object like property lookup, 
Uh, and then for things that are events, think about these like as, as functions, like on click or something like that, that's a function call. So this is just a, a short way that you can kind of remember how to do it. Uh, I've got one minute, let's go. Component five. Oh, wow. Time goes slower in Spain. Uh, so we have, uh, we have this input and an output. So these, uh, it's quite an interesting change from Angular 1 to Angular 2 components. Uh, we kind of know how this works. We have selector and styles and templates. But so before we look at that, we'll, I'll show you it in Angular 1, because changing from scope to bindings is quite easy. So this bindings object is just one place that we can define like inputs and outputs. So here our input is user, and the output is going to be on update. Now, if you're using TypeScript, does anyone not like TypeScript in here? Nobody would admit it anyway. Um, so instead of doing this bindings object where we declare the types of syntax that we want to use, like a left arrow or an ampersand, we use these at input and highlight the wrong one, at input and output. So here we just call it uh, user. So we say user is going to be an input. We expect that property to be bound to. It's going to come in. Uh, if you don't do that, it will throw an error because it, the property doesn't exist. You can't bind to something that doesn't exist. And then the output. Now this is the interesting piece is that we have this thing called event emitter. So we have to create this instance of an event emitter. Um, hopefully they'll clean this up because it's kind of, yeah. Uh, so that basically corresponds to this here. So you see where we're calling this dot on update in Angular 1. We then create this object called dollar event, which then gets passed back in dollar event. In here, we use event emitter, and then we basically, you see the property name? output status change. So it basically binds an instance of event emitter to the property itself. And then here, we can actually call this emit method. So we can emit something. So we've, we've got data down into the component. We can change it. And then once we have a button, like this is a, a toggle status. So if you wanted to go offline, you can press toggle status. It fires this emit. It passes the new user object back up. So there's some logic here that just basically inverts the user's status. So we can pass that back up to the, uh, to the parent component, the stateful component that then manages. We can communicate with the back end, send the user offline, et cetera. Uh, cool. I decided uh, not to redo the piece on the router. Because if you've been, who's been following the Angular 2 router stuff? Yeah, it, it basically lives and dies every day. Uh, it gets rewritten all the time. So this is the slightly older version of than last week's uh, Angular 2 router. So we import these routes, router directives. It's pretty simple. Uh, and this kind of goes back to that last concept that I mentioned, that if we wanted to turn this into a routed component, we can use config. We can pass in you know, your state provider, all that. That's good spelling. Uh, you can pass in all your UI routes for that particular component. This has changed slightly in the new, new, new router, but it, the, you can still create routed components. So we'll essentially have another class here, and we decorate it with at routes, and then we have path, and we can define all these things. Um, here we're actually defining like inbox component. I think you can, in the new version of the router, you can basically create them component-less, or you can tie them to components. That's my understanding. Um, uh, yeah, if you've used like UI router, UI, uh, you, you'll have used UI view. So we basically, that's the router outlet. Uh, and then we've got these directives, which basically create the links between our views or components. And I use the word views. <coughs> So views are kind of like dead now. It's all, it's all about components. If I, I think I've said it like 700 times today. So everything's a component. It might be a rooted component. So if, uh, if you're in Gmail, your inbox could just be a, an inbox component. It's not a, a view anymore. 
So when we started to create all these views, you end up with a lot of mess. So if you, like a thousand lines of HTML with ng clicks and ng ifs and ng repeats everywhere, and you've got one controller powering the whole thing, and it becomes extremely complicated. So to sum up, think about the types of the components that you may create or are creating. Embrace the lifecycle hooks. Um, these are really important. Um, if you've used React before, they have well-defined lifecycle hooks, um, like when a component is mounted, when it's ready, when data's coming in, all these kind of things. So now it's Angular's turn to be cool as well. So do those two things well and build cool things. So thank you for having me. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk and the rest of the day. Thank you.